go again and read from verse 21 through verse 24. It has been read already very ably in your hearing, but I just want to read again for the sake uh, of emphasis. So you should have had your book marked then, which I think you know that's where I was going. Mark 5, 21, if you have it, say amen. 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 I believe the Bible is the word of God. Say amen again. Amen. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side. Mm -hmm. Much people gathered unto mm -hmm. him, and he was nigh unto the sea. Yeah, yeah. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, that is, when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. Yeah. Yeah. And besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. She shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. Yeah. From this passage, I want to... Uh, I want to talk with you tonight from the subject, a portrait of a faithful father. Okay. A portrait of a faithful father. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, one of the names used to describe our heavenly father is Jehovah Shema. Uh -huh. Jehovah Shema means the God who is there. And many homes in America tonight are suffering from the fact and the reality that the Father is not there. Not there. And this has given rise to an expression called the Phantom Father. Phantom Father is not uh, just limited to absentee fathers, but it can be applied to fathers who are in the home. Even when they are there, they are not there. And so phantom fathers are not just fathers off yonder somewhere. But phantom father can be a father that's there in the home, but he's not there. Millions of men have fathered children and simply walked away from the family. And let me say, producing a child does not make a man a father. It Amen. just says that he is Amen. fertile. Amen. Uh, but to be a father, you have to be more than fertile. Uh, you have to be faithful. Amen. Uh, faithful in shouldering the responsibilities that come along with being a father and being there for your children yes. is one of those responsibilities. Amen. Being there is not just being there. There are some men, even though they are living in the home with their children, they are they are so absorbed by their careers that they seldom spend time with their children. Yeah. And the effects can be almost as devastating uh, as them not being there at all. The effects are felt not only by the children, but we see the effects in our communities Amen. all around us. Yeah. Yeah. Did you not know that just a decade ago, the number of murders committed by teenagers was approximately 1,000 a year? Today, that number is around 4,000 a year. Some would like to blame poverty. Some say broken homes, and I'm sure physical and mental abuse has a part to play in this. But as one psychologist put it, put it, uh, he put it this way, he said, there are many kids that come from the same backgrounds as these kids, but they are not committing acts of violence, which means that you can't blame, you can't blame it all on environment. No. Environment and life experiences play a part, certainly plays a part in how we turn out, but ultimately it's not what happens to you, but what happens in you that matters. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you know, you don't have to become what you've been through. No. Just because you've been battered doesn't mean that you have to become a batterer. Yeah. Yeah. 
just because you've been abandoned doesn't mean that you have to be one who abandons your family. Just because you've been hated don't mean you have to become a hater. Because you've been deserted, you don't have to become a deserter. And because you've been abused, you don't have to become an abuser. You don't have to become what you have been through. You know, environmental and ex experiential factors they do make a difference and they should not be ignored. Some have linked violent crimes and other negative behavior to absentee and neglectful fathers, yeah. including teen pregnancies and teen suicides. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, there are 24 million children living in homes without fathers. What a shame. In the past 30 years, there have been at least a 550% increase in violent crimes in our communities. And when I share these statistics with people, sometimes statistics can be kind of dry. Mm -hmm. But I want you to get a sense of what's going on in our communities and what's going on really in our families. Yeah. Because everyone who's committing these crimes is a part of somebody's family. Yeah. 500% increase in violent crimes, 400% increase in illegitimate births, 200% increase in teen pregnancies, and 300% increase in teen suicide. More than 70% of all juveniles in state reform institution comes from fatherless homes. And when you talk to men in prison, and I know, I know, I know when I go through this, Sometimes the men in the audience feel like, well, you know, we're being bashed here tonight. But if I'm not talking to you, I'm not talking to you. But I got to talk about these problems. Because if we don't talk about the problems, we'll never be able to solve the problems that we face. Yeah, yeah. But when you talk to men in prison, you're going to find that the overwhelming majority of them have issues with their fathers. Either they were not there or they were abusive or irresponsible. So the picture is pretty clear and no one should deny the importance of having a father who is a father in the home. The home doesn't need a man in the house, it needs a father in the house. Yeah. Amen, somebody. Amen. But, 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 but in this portion of scripture, in this, in this text, we're told about a man by the name of Jairus, or Jairus, and he was a religious man. He was a ruler of a local synagogue, but he was also a father. Verse 21 tells us that Jesus was coming back from uh, Gadaria. He had entered again into Capernaum. And you remember down in Gadaria, he encountered a man uh, that was uh, possessed of demons, and he was uh, living uh, in the graveyard. Yeah. Yeah. And the Bible says no man could tame this man, right. and he had a legion of demons yeah. on the inside. Uh -huh. And when Jesus, uh, bless my bones, the thing about this, but when Jesus got done with the man, the Bible says he was observed sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, what a picture and what yeah. a statement. Uh, you know, true sanity is always found at the feet of Jesus. Amen, somebody. Yeah. When arriving uh, upon the shore, uh, the Bible says people it, uh, evidently had been looking Jesus waiting for him because his reputation has spread throughout uh, uh, the region and so when he arrived the Bible says they thronged him or they swarmed all around him yeah. but in that crowd there was a man and the Holy Spirit focuses on this one individual who had a desperate need the Bible says his daughter was sick unto death. Yeah. The Bible calls him a ruler of the synagogue, which means he was a man of position. He was a man of prominence, and his position made him one of the most prominent men of the congregation. Yeah. He wasn't a teacher, he wasn't a preacher, but he was responsible for the order of service in the synagogue. Yeah. 
And at every service, it was this man, Jairus or Jairus, who appointed somebody to lead the prayer and someone to read yeah. the scripture. And if there was a visiting rabbi in the house, he would invite him to read the scriptures and, and afterwards to give a commentary and expound upon what he read. Yeah. So here we have a man, and we see a man of high social position. He was a man known among the people. He was a man of prestige and power, but he was a man who had a desperate need and there was a crisis in his family. Yeah. And I need yeah. to tell some dad in the house tonight that you have never become so powerful, never become so popular, yeah. never become so high and rise so high that problems cannot trouble or reach you. Come on, power yeah. and prestige cannot insulate you from every trouble that may come your Amen. way. Amen. So this man's little girl, the apple of his eye was dying. His prestige and his position and whatever money he may have had was not enough to save his daughter yeah. from the plight that she was in. Yeah. He needed something else. Yeah. In this case, he needed the humility uh -huh. to seek out Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Dad, you can't take care of your children without some help. Come on. Amen, Amen, somebody. I know, I know us men, we don't like to ask for help. We can be driving and be just as lost as we can get and still won't ask for directions. You know, God so helped us out with them GPS stuff. You know what I'm saying? With that GPS, global positioning satellite. We can get some help from on high. Amen, somebody. Thank God for that. But just me, you know us men, and I'm talking about all us men here tonight. We don't like to ask for help. Sometimes we can be desperate and at the end of our rope, and sometimes we'll just go ahead and fall off the rope before we ask anybody to give us some help. Amen. Do I have a church up in here? But listen, if we are going to stay on course, with leading our families and meeting their deepest needs, we have to wake up to the notion and the idea that we are going to need some help. Yeah. Yeah. Every now and then. Every now and then. And the greatest help you can have is Jesus. Yes, Not just in your children's moments of sickness, but all the days of their lives. Yeah. You're going to need yeah. some help from Jesus yeah. to raise healthy, good, godly children. Yes, man. If his daughter had a diary, one of the first things she would probably record is that her father was not ashamed to seek out Jesus. Oh, what a witness, what a testimony yeah. that my yeah. yeah. father was not ashamed yeah. to yeah. seek out Jesus. Yes. And notice who it was that sought out Jesus. He didn't send his wife. Come on, he, didn't man, man. he didn't send somebody else, yeah, yeah. but he sought Jesus for himself. Yeah. And there are just too many men who think that it's a woman's thing to go to church. It's a woman's thing to take the children to Sunday school. Yeah, yeah. It's not just a woman's thing, it's a man's thing. Come on. Come on. We ought not to be ashamed to seek out Jesus. Yeah. Well, when you took on the role of the father, you also were supposed to take on the responsibility so. of the father. Yeah. And the first responsibility is to make sure that the Lord is in the equation. Yeah. When it comes down to trying to build a godly home, make sure God, make sure the Lord, make sure Jesus is in the equation. Yeah. Uh -huh. Paul yeah. tells us in Ephesians 6 and verse number 4, and ye father. Yeah, right. Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture. And that word nurture means training and discipline. In the nurture, the training and discipline and the admonition of the law. Amen. Amen. Do you not know it's the primary responsibility 
of the father to teach his children about God. Yes, I say it's the father. Amen. It's primarily the father's yes. responsibility. Yes. It's not the mother's responsibility. It's not even the church's responsibility. Y'all get mighty quiet. Right? Oh, yeah. Yet many mothers in churches have to take on that responsibility simply because the father has abdicated his responsibility or else he just don't realize that it's primarily his responsibility. Amen. Yes, sir. Yep. Fathers have a role to play. But the father has the primary responsibility to see that it's done. Yes, sir. Church and Sunday school can only assist you in the training of your children. Amen. Paul says to the father, provoke them not to wrath. He didn't say to the mother, provoke them not to wrath. But he says to the father, now what are you saying, preacher, that mothers can't provoke? No, he's not saying that mothers can't provoke, but the one who is more apt to provoke a child to wrath is the father. He somebody with his bass voice and his big presence and his strong muscles. He's going to provoke children to wrath. And if it were not the tendency that men have more of a proclivity toward that, then Paul would have addressed the women as well as the men, but he addressed the man and he said, be careful. Don't you provoke, don't exasperate your children, don't frustrate them with unreasonable demand. Yes. Yes. And here's something else that you all not ever do. Don't ever compare your children to other children. Come on now. Yeah. And you know why you all don't do that? Because every child is unique. You can have two or more kids born of the same parents coming out of the same womb and yet each or every one of them will have unique gifts and abilities and they're different from the other. Don't compare them to each other and don't compare them to anybody else's child. Yeah. Amen. Put, don't put unfair demands. And I'm talking to daddies today because Paul is the one who addressed you daddies, us daddies, and said, don't you exasperate your children. Don't provoke them to wrath because it's your tendency to do that. That doesn't mean that women don't do it. Women may do it, but he ain't talking to women. And I ain't talking to women today either. Oh, some of our problem is as soon as somebody gets to straighten us up, they say, well, what about so-and-so? Well, I ain't talking about so-and-so. I'm talking about us. Stay where you are, brother. Amen, somebody. Amen. I'm going to try not to be long, but I'm going to try to hold you strong while I got you. Let me tell you something else, Dad, is teach your children to feel the ball. Yes, Amen. Teach them to fear the Lord and to turn away from evil and to love righteousness. Amen. 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 Teach them to hate iniquity. Yes. Instill in them good attitudes and God's attitude towards sin. Yes. We need to know what God's attitude. You know what? You know, it's amazing that people don't understand uh, uh, how devastating and how evil and how wrong sinful activity is and that's because they don't know the mind of God. They don't read the Bible and they don't believe the Bible. Father, you've got to be a living Bible for your children and teach them that God has an attitude towards sin. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes. But what's most importantly, you got to live before God. The way that you would have them to live before God. Yeah. You can't live like that ridiculous code. Do as I say, not as I do. They will do what they see you do. Teaching God has a purpose for their lives. Teaching the wisdom of the word where it says, remember now. I created yes, yes, in the days yes, of the youth. Yes, this thing about you know sowing your wild oats while you're young. Yes, Amen, somebody. <laughs> Y'all ain't looking right. Let me talk to these folks over here. Some people sit up in church like they ain't never heard that kind of shit. You know, you know I don't know about that. <laughs> he ain't talking to me. He's talking to them. 
his name. I saw your eyes. No, 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 no. You know, saw your eyes. Those by you. Listen. Listen, listen, you're going to get old one day. Ain't no sense in sowing wild oats and then praying for a crop failure. Because what you sow, I say what you sow, y'all ain't going to talk back to me. Right? What you sow, you're going to read. Wow, you yo, you get to sow so many wild oats and you won't have no nothing. Never mind. Teach it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot. I thought I was back home. Come on, with it. So you teach, teach them. Fathers, it's your responsibility. It is more your responsibility than it is your wives to make sure that your children are brought up and raised in the admonition of the Lord. Teach them by your life and teach them by your actions, not just words. For words mean very little if they're not applied. Come on. Amen. Come on. Now listen, you're not perfect. Yeah. Amen. Right. Somebody don't fall in that trap of trying to project the image that you're perfect. You're not perfect. And right. guess what? Your children know you're not perfect. Amen. Amen. They still They're with you almost 24 7. They know you're not perfect. Yeah. yeah. See, the worst damage is not done when they find out when they find out that you're not perfect. The worst damage is done when they find out that you are not perfect and you lie about it and pretend to be something that you're not. Yeah. And make your mistakes. And you gain credibility with your kids. Let them see that you need Jesus too. Yeah. Yeah. Amen, somebody. Don't tell me. No one will tell you. Boy, you need Jesus. Yeah, you need Jesus too. <laughs> Teach them that God loves them too much to reward them for their disobedience. Amen. Teach them that God's love is unconditional, but his promises are not. Yeah. Yeah. I says his promises are not unconditional. Amen. God's promises are based on conditions. His love is unconditional. He loves you. It doesn't matter what you wind up in and how you conduct yourself. God still loves you. Amen. But if you're going to receive the promises of God, you're going to have to toe the line. Come Amen. on now. Amen. Teach them. They can't expect God to bless them with finances. Without honoring God with the first fruits of their increase. I thought I'd drop that in there. Somebody. Yes, the reason we wind up with a bunch of folk in the church that don't know how to honor the Lord is because their parents haven't taught them how to honor the Lord. Amen. Let me tell you something. Though. If you wait until then, you can bring them to the church house and have the preacher or the Sunday school teacher teach them that, you're waiting too long and you're waiting too late. So a reaping is an irrevocable reality. God multiplies only the seed that's sown. So, and if you ain't sowing nothing, he doesn't have anything to multiply. Come oh. on. Teach them that they can't expect God to bless them with wisdom without the word. Don't expect God to bless you with freedom without forgiveness. Don't expect God to bless you with victory. Without accountability. Yes, yes. He's not going to bless you with abundance without obedience. Yeah. Teach it and then practice it yourself. Come on, yeah. Come on. Teach them to raise their aim and elevate their game. Teach them that low living can mess up your high calling. We have a high calling of God in Christ. Isn't that right? Amen. Paul Amen. says, I'm pressed toward the mark. Of the prize of the high calling of God, yeah. which is in Christ Jesus. Yeah. I'm trying to teach my daughters not to settle for just anything. Amen. Young ladies, stop settling for lazy land. Crackhead free. Blood smoking Bobby. Locked up Lester. How are you looking right Stop selling for gambling Barry and dice rolling Dotson and don't selling Daryl and gin and juice drinking Jimmy. I was saying amen, man. Listen, your low living can mess up your high calling. 
Stop selling for contact and Curtis and dead beat Billy and won't stay home Jerome and ain't got no money sunny. Somebody said, that's too raw for me. I'm trying to tell you to stop selling. Stop selling for won't pay the bill field. Don't go to work, Kurt. Stay in the streets, Pete.
had food on the table, clothes on their back, and to take care of them when they need to be uh, going to the doctor, whatever they need. That was their notion about demonstrating their love. Yeah, amen. Work and sacrifice for your family. Although in hindsight, I would much rather have had less things and more of him. More of his time spent with us. Doing some things. I've never played catch with my daddy. Never went fishing with my daddy. My daddy works seven days a week. You know, things are not everything. Things are not everything. No, 